patient will be examining the vision, the concept, and the principle about the access, the quality, and equity to online education. Three world caliber keynote speaker will be sharing and enlightening us about the topic. Dr. Martin Jokiyama, uh, the founder of the model, Professor Tian Belawati at the University of Terbuka Indonesia, and Professor Simon Bedford, the Western Sydney University. First, I would like to inform all of participants uh, regarding the uh, session QA. Please post your questions on the chat. Then we are going to collect and select your questions and post uh, in the at the end of the plenary session. Without further ado, I would like to commence the first keynote speaker. Uh, but because uh, Dr. Martin Takuyama has not been uh, joining with us, then uh, we are going to uh, switch the uh, Professor Tian Pelawati who will be the first speaker. Please listen and enjoy uh, Professor Tian Pelawati uh, switch. Hi everyone, a very good morning to all of you. It's a pleasure for me to be here and I thank the organizer for inviting me to speak at this very important <coughs> conference. So this is a very exciting time because I think we are almost at the end of the pandemic. And talking about pandemic, if we have to think about one word in education that comes into our mind when uh, we talk about the pandemic period, that would be the online learning because the pandemic has accelerated the practice of online learning around the world to an extraordinary level. So, but let's talk about this online learning, whether or not online learning has been able to provide us with equity in accessing quality education. So we have to thank the internet because before we had the internet, it is very impossible for people to access education as easily as it is right now. And because of the internet, I think we had a crucial shift in education sector where everybody or almost everybody from traditional classroom teaching now can do it online and provide education to everybody around the world. And this uh, interactive online learning can only be made possible since the second generation of the technology of the World Wide Web, which allows us or myself, for example, as an internet user, not only to become a consumer of the information, but also to become a producer of the information. Because of the interactivity feature of the uh, technology of the World Wide Web, now everybody, the uh, content creators, can share and upload their creations in the internet and distribute it to the users. And this has led to a paradigm, what we now uh, know as a, a sharing paradigm, uh, which is further lead to what we also have uh, been witnessing, which is the global open movement. And this global open movement, especially in education, has resulted in two big and very important phenomena, and that is the birth of the open educational resources and practices, and also of the massive open online courses, better known as MOOC, and its derivations such as the micro-credentials and also the MOOC degree, uh, the, the MOOC-based degree programs. Now, the acceptance of online learning by the people around the world can also indicate it by the growth in the e-learning or online learning industry. According to the e-learning e industry website, uh, online learning has been the quickest growing market in the education industry. The global e-learning market is expected to grow 
uh, over 240 billion US dollar by next year. And the mobile e-learning market alone is expected to surpass the 38,000 billion US dollar by the end of this year, and it is expected to even grow up to $80 million dollar, billion dollar by 2027. The MOOC market is also no exception. The MOOC market is currently worth over $5 billion and projected to grow at an annual rate of 32% until 2025. But we have to remember, online learning is learning that is done and mediated by the internet. So if we don't have internet connection, we cannot access online learning, which means that many people who don't have good internet connection are not being able to take advantage of the good and quality online learning resources. So now let's see whether online learning has justified our ability to provide access and equity to education to everybody, especially to those who are in the marginalized area. If we look at the data, the internet penetration in the world is not evenly distributed. If we look at the diagram or the bar chart on the left-hand side, the blue bar shows that in Asia, where 54% of the world population located, the penetration of internet is only around 63%, while in other regions, especially in Europe and North America, where the population is much lower, the penetration is much higher. Further data also show that 71% of internet users live in the top 20 countries with a penetration at around 20% while the 29% of the internet users live in the rest of the world with the penetration only around 10%. Similarly, if we look at the languages that are used in the internet, data shows that 63% of the language used in the top 10 million websites is English. So that is not uh, surprising that, that 70% of the world's e-learning market is from the US and European market who are speaking English as their first language. This reminds me of a very uh, famous picture which uh, visually show the differences between reality, equality, equity, and liberation. So apparently, based on the data that I just showed you, we are still in the very left-hand side box, which is the reality. We are still far from equity. And we want to be in the far hand, uh, right-hand side of the box, which is the liberation, where all hindering factors to internet access and to online learning uh, are removed, which, uh, which is uh, related to the internet connectivity and the language which means that we have to build more infrastructure to internet access. And it also means that we have to campaign and we have to increase the use of other languages uh, to create content to be uploaded to the internet and to become learning resources for everybody. Just to give you illustrations about how is the gap, the, there is a study from OECD uh, shows that while 95% of students in Switzerland, Norway, and Austria have a computer to use for their schoolwork, only about 30%, 34% of children in Indonesia do. And even within a country, so the gap is not only among the continents or among different countries, but even within a country and within a developed country, for example, in the US, Data shows that there is a significant gap between those from the free village and disadvantaged background, which uh, virtually all 50 years old from a privileged background said that they had a computer to work on. Nearly 25% of those from the disadvantaged background did not have any computer to work on in their homes. So those are the fact that we had been uh, witnessing before the pandemic. So now let's talk about the impact of the pandemic. So COVID-19, I think we all agree, has become the largest disruption in education in all history. It has affected 
nearly 1.6 billion students, that is about a 94% student population in the world, from all over the continent in about 190 countries. And COVID-19 has also accentuated the underlying trend that has been created and started by the Industrial Revolution 4.0. Those are including automation, the use of digital electronic platform, and also the digital divide that leads to wider gaps in accessing quality education. Just as an illustration, in Indonesia, for example, the pandemic closed down 530,000 educational institutions, which are forced to move their in-class teaching into online teaching. In the meantime, Indonesia is also lacking IT infrastructure, poor internet connectivity for rural and remote areas, and data show that four out of five internet users in Indonesia live in Java and Sumatra Islands. Many low-income students and teachers do not have digital devices or skills required for home-based learning. 67% of teachers reported difficulties in operating devices and using online learning platforms. And the World Bank estimates that 90 91,000 children dropping out of school in Indonesia due to the pandemic induced by family income losses. Social media platform and conferencing applications are the more popular than educational technologies for digital learning due to their ease of use, affordability, and not so high internet speed requirement. So what, with this kind of situation, you can imagine what kind of quality that online learning during the pandemic is in Indonesia. Another study by RISE Indonesia shows that many teachers are unable to teach to the best of their ability. 30% of teachers in Java and 50% of teachers outside Java do not teach every working day. In many cases, their students have either no smartphone or internet access. Teachers have to visit their students' home and usually only hand out assignments and often unable to assess students' assignment nor provide opportunities for questions and answer sessions. Also, not all parents have the capacity to support due to limited facilities, both in the smartphone and internet data. Family usually only have one smartphone to be used by all the children that has to do online learning. This has resulted in a situation where children who come from a less supportive home environment have lower performance than their friends who come from a better supportive home environment. And this has confirmed that children from lower socioeconomic background suffer a proportionately greater loss due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Having said that, nevertheless, we also see some silver lining from the COVID-19 pandemic. COVID-19 has revealed higher education system vulnerabilities, but has also surveyed extraordinary human resourcefulness and potential. COVID-19 has also accelerated the adoption and belief on online learning and has increased students and professors or teachers' interest in blended and online learning. This is a huge leap because if we have students and professors and teachers are comfortable with online learning, the possibility of us to provide equity to uh, quality learning to everybody is even higher. Just to give you some illustration how the pandemic has increased the uh, interest and participation in online learning, the data from the Indonesia Open University, better known as Universitas Terbuka, has shown that when we had the pandemic, the increase in participation in online learning is 73%. And that has resulted in the increase of the number of the virtual class in the Open University by 295%. So that is a huge leap for Indonesia and for UT. So it seems that the pandemic has really brought us to a new world and to a new normal. And as UNESCO said, we cannot return to the world as it was before. And it also seems that online learning 
or quality online learning seems to be here to stay. And I think this is very important. The question for us now is how for us to maintain and to sustain this online learning so we can provide equity to education. And for us to make online learning more accessible to more people and to reach equity for education, we need to revisit five Latin issues. And those are definition of education, equity and inclusion, connectivity, access to learning resources, as well as digital divide and digital literacy. More specifically, UNESCO and the UN said that we have to strengthen our commitment to education as a common good. We have to put equity and inclusion at the center of efforts. We have to expand the definition of the right to education to include connectivity entitlement. And the government need to support OERs to ensure contextuality and relevance of free and easy access to digital content. We have to remove barriers to connectivity by investing in digital infrastructure and reducing connectivity costs. We have to bridge digital divide by investing for investment in digital literacy for marginalized population. And last but not least, we have to also include the use of low-tech and no-tech approaches and technologies in addition uh, to the high and digital technologies. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for listening to me and have a very good day. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, everyone. I think uh, all of you would like to quite anxious who is actually Professor Tian Pilawati. So I would like to share to all of you who actually see it.